Hey, Barbara. Hi, Sandy. How are you doing? I'm fine. Just got out of another meeting, so I feel like I'm, you know, got the Zoom thing going today, but. <laughs> I see. I always laugh when, um, you know, we were first working at home with COVID, you know, everybody's at home wearing like 500 layers because yeah. <laughs> nobody heats their house. To like right. this I know. Stuff. I know. I, I'm here. It is this beautiful sunny day and I've got my still got my vest. Right. On. I have a shirt over my shoulder. I'll, I'll take yep. off when we start. <laughs> I need to move to the south side of the house to to get get going. But um, it'll be here. It'll be too warm before too long. Right. Right. Oh, yeah. Kind of interesting. Some of the rule changes coming. I know, I know. And it's hard to know. Um, oh, you're, you're recording so we can. Wait yeah. To, yeah. Yeah. But, um, yeah, we'll, we'll definitely keep people up to date on those and, and, you know, seek comments. Uh, you know, I think there's some questions about the signature and how we can figure out a way to ensure access to properties. So mm -hmm. we can actually, you know, commissions can actually get their jobs done. Right. Yeah. So, so we'll see. You have those poll questions. Ready? I do. Yes. Let me, let me see. Um, yep. We got them. Okay. Yeah. How many times have you done this, uh, or, or I've done a wetland permit training class for us. I feel like you're at half a dozen at least. <laughs> Probably. <I know. laughs> because you've, I think we've had one at the last, you know, four conferences at least, and then maybe a couple other ones. I don't know. Yeah. Well, in the past, I, you know, I would do, uh, you know, I still have some of the old ones The, you know, I did a 101 and a, yep. a 201. Uh, right. Also to split it so that it wasn't all in one session. Um then we've always, you know, we've done updates. The other thing is that we've sometimes, uh, you know, we had the land resource management workshops mm -hmm. annually, which were open to anybody. Um, so there was that way for at least some people to attend. I know people would have to take a day from work to do it, but yeah. Well, you can never get enough training on, on wetland permit right. review. <laughs> which is why we're doing this. <laughs> Thank you all for joining us who've signed in early. It's nice to see those familiar names out there. Seems like everybody's kind of trained now to, to sign on to Zoom, stay muted, wait for the program to begin, but we appreciate it uh, that you're here a little early to get this meeting going on time.
Morning. Hey, Paul, how are you? Tired. <laughs> Tired. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I was just uh, just got out of another Zoom meeting, so I feel like it's it's one of those days where you're it's cranking it out, but that's yeah. all right. Yeah, I had a, a closing this morning. The Conservation Commission bought a little piece of land. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah. that's exciting. Yep, yep. If you're on Facebook, I just posted about it. Awesome. I'll yeah. have to share that. So any wetlands on the uh, on the property? No, it's an odd triangular piece of land that's kind of in the middle of an existing town forest with a state highway on the third side. Okay. And, and uh, it's a part of the highway that, uh, you know, it's limited access and nobody could get a driveway permit. Okay. So we were able to pick it up for the tax assessed value of twenty three thousand eight hundred. Hey, is, that's pretty good. That's dirt cheap for land. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Especially in your neighborhood, for oh, sure. Oh yeah, yeah. Right, right. Acre and a half would have been buildable if they could put a driveway in. Yeah. Well, it's nice that it's kind of in the donut hole there and fills that in. Yep. Yep. Right. Well, good. No wonder you're you um, <laughs> tired out. That can be a lot of. That's a lot of work uh, purchasing land. So it is. Yep. Yeah. A lot of pieces coming together for for those projects. Yeah. Well, and congratulations. We a, Good we work. Have, we have a big project coming together at the end of May for a 15 acre parcel that got both uh, L chip and Arm Fund money. Oh, nice. And so there's a lot of paperwork for that. Um, yes. Yeah. Those those grants are are yeah. um, pretty extensive. Um, yeah. And I know they're a competitive program. So mm -hmm. yeah, we're Good. working Good. on a management plan that DES needs us to do, and also a, a conservation easement to be held by CELT, mm -hmm. DES requires. So those are sort of the two big missing pieces at the moment. Okay. Yep. Oh, well, it's good news from Atkinson. For yeah, sure. yeah. Good for you. So it looks like we're going to have a nice group today, a pretty big crowd. Um, and I'm going to wait a few more minutes before we get started because it looks like a lot of people are just signing in now so feel free to grab your drink or your lunch or whatever you need to to get through this hour and a half so we'll start right at noon Sandy, I just made you co-host too, so. All right, well, it is noon, so I'm going to get started. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us. Uh, my name is Barbara Richter, and I'm the Executive Director at the New Hampshire Association of Conservation Commissions. And at NHACC, um, we're a nonprofit organization that works to support conservation commissions um, in New Hampshire so that they can be successful in protecting their local natural resources. So we provide education and assistance to 217 conservation commissions here in New Hampshire. We represent our members um, in the state legislature and on other state boards as well. Uh, we have a very popular conference. It's the first Saturday of November, so you can always check out our website for more information on our conference and other educational programs. So before we get started, though, just a quick remind, a few quick reminders. Uh, it looks like most of you are already muted, but um, just double check your mute button and make sure you are muted because we do have a large uh, group and we'll often get some background noise if you're not muted. So thank you for that. And we, we will invite you to ask questions today. Um, again, because it's a large group, uh, the most efficient way is to use your chat box on the bottom of your screen there. 
And I'll be monitoring the chat box for questions as we go through. So um, <clears throat> again, this is the uh, fourth session of our wetland training program series. Uh, we created this series to help conservation commissions better evaluate their local water resources and develop a program uh, for protection. So NHACC developed this program with the assistance of New Hampshire um, Department of Environmental Services. And we have uh, Marianne Tilton from DES is, is with us here today. And uh, we've also worked with Sandy Crystal, who, who will be our presenter today, and Rick Vanderpool, a certified wetland scientist. So, so it's great to have um, the attendance has been very high at all these meetings and training. So it's, it's great to have you all here. Today's program is the um, going to cover DES rules and the permit review process. So we're going to go over um, permit classification and the impacts that determine um, what, wet, what wetland permit to use. Um, and we'll identify those various classifications and thresholds. Um, and we've invited Sandy Crystal here today, who's really going to help walk us through the, the wetland permit process. Sandy Crystal is a professional wetland scientist and Bow Conservation Commission member. Uh, Sandy worked for New Hampshire DES for more than 23 years, serving in the Wetlands and Watershed Management Bureau. Um, Sandy also worked in the Drinking Water and Groundwater Bureau, coordinating the Source Water Land Conservation Grant Program. Um, she's on two boards in Bow, the Planning Board, and she's chair of the Bow Conservation Commission. So we'd like to welcome Sandy and thank thank her for her her great uh, contributions to this training series. Welcome, Sandy. Great, thank you very much, Barbara. Um, let me get my screen up, uh, oh, share screen, let me just. Oops. Well, oh. <laughs> uh, too many things going by here. All right. All right, that looks good on my end. Great. Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, um, I will be uh, presenting um, the slides and material, and um, we're lucky to have Marianne Tilton with the um, NHDES Wetlands Bureau here, who has um, probably a store of knowledge greater than all of us put together, um, and has, uh, you know, daily uh, use of, of all the um, aspects of the rules. Um, so I guess, um, Barbara, why don't we start with the poll questions because that will be helpful. Um... Sure, um, I'm going to launch the shoreland question. Is everybody uh, checking that one out? This is, is your conservation commission in a community where lakefront development or docking structures are a significant part of your wetland permit application or notifications? Um, and I'll kind of talk about that a little bit later, but wanted to get... Um... Looks like it's about 50-50. I'll, I'll give everybody okay. a, a minute or two more. Um, to, to answer that question and then I should be able to share it. Yeah, it's it's a 50-50. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Yep. Yeah, that's that's good to know about 50-50. Uh okay. And how about the um next question also? Okay. Hold on one second. So, so this is um, yeah, go ahead. How often do applicants um, with wetland permit applications present their project to, to your conservation commission before submitting the wetland application? It's a good mix on that one too. I'm gonna give it another minute before <laughs> we have everybody uh, 
signed in. So far, rarely has a strong showing. Yeah, 13%. And yeah. All right, I'll share the results. Are you able to see the results? I, I just saw the breakout. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it, it's uh, good to have that information. I guess um, uh, one is really directly related to the presentation and the um, uh, other one is um, just some kind of helpful information overall. Okay. Um, so um, let me go to the, I'm going to go to the next slide. Okay. All right, great. Um, so I'm gonna give just a really um, kind of overview background of the topics covered in the previous sessions. I'll talk about the um, project and impact classification with uh, wetland applications and talk about some of the associated required information, um, which applications are reviewed by conservation commissions and, and others that are not reviewed by conservation commissions as, as a, a part of the process. Um, and, and then, and then um, talk a little bit about the um, permitting processes um, and requirements and uh, talk a little bit about um, resources. Okay. Um, so in previous um, uh, wetland training sessions um, this year, um, we covered what is a wetland and how a wetland delineation is done, uh, the types of um, wetlands, um, jurisdictional areas under uh, RSA 42A, so wetlands and other um, jurisdictional areas, including streams, lakes, um, upland tidal buffer zone, you know, the whole gamut. Uh, uh, state, federal, local jurisdiction, um, we spoke about, and um, uh, Steph uh, Titro from the Wetlands Bureau gave a great presentation about online mapping tools. So I encourage you, if you've um, missed any of the presentations, to try and go back and um, look at the recording because they should be um, helpful to you. Um, so one of the really uh, important aspects to the wetland rules is to basically have an idea of um, their structure. They can be um, overwhelming, um, but this table provides kind of a, an overview of the different sections. The wetland rules are in ENV-WT, and they go from 100 to 1,000. Uh, had been to 900 until the registration of le legally existing non-tidal docks was added. Um, and I will be covering parts of the rules mostly in the 300, 400, 500, 600 area, at least to some extent, and also in the 900 for the stream crossings. Um, I encourage you as you go through this, if we don't cover things that you uh, would like to hear more about that are that can't be answered in a, a Q and A at the end. Um, please provide that in your evaluation comments so we have a better idea of uh, additional uh, resources that would be helpful to you. So when the rules went through the significant update in uh, late 2019. Um, there were some uh, changes in terminology, additions, um, a whole bunch of acronyms added and such. And so um, while I don't tend to throw around the acronyms, it would be helpful to you, um, you know, to maybe be familiar with a, a few of them. And just, uh, I just wanted to kind of uh, bring that um, to your attention, but uh, I think the slides will be fairly self-explanatory. So uh, 
in this diagram, the different types of wetland applications and authorizations have been grouped by the impact classification um, categories in the rules. Um, so the minimum impact category has a, a whole variety of application, notification, registration types. And then we have the standard dredge and fill application, which includes um, minor or major, and also some minimum applications. So the impact classification um, in the rules focuses on um, the size of impact, the resource type, and the project type. And we'll be going through each of these categories um, to review what the requirements are, or at least some of them are where you can find more of the requirements. So uh, starting with size, the size impact uh, in square feet or linear feet, depending upon the type of resource. So if it's a other than water course, so which is uh, wetlands and just anything that's not a flowing water body, you have the minimum, minor, major categories uh, that start with a square foot of impact with less than 3,000 square feet for minimum, uh, major is 10,000 square feet or greater, and minor is um, all the projects that are, have impacts in between those. With the water course, you have the size measured in terms of linear feet. So the mini minimum impact is less than 50 linear feet, and the major impact is 200 linear feet or greater. And as I've noted on the bottom, and we'll be going through that, there are adjustments to the classification. Um, we haven't reviewed the resource type or the project type, but this is kind of a starting area. I do want to highlight though, that for measuring linear impacts to a stream, if it's an intermittent stream versus a perennial stream, the impacts are measured differently. And that is because for an intermittent stream, uh, in this diagram, we have kind of a 49 linear feet of impact. So on the intermittent stream, you're measuring the impact along the thread of the stream, the thread of the channel. And so that's 49 linear feet of impact would be minimum impact if there was no other uh, criteria um, to check. The perennial stream, you're going to, the 49 feet is 49 feet of bank A, 49 feet of bank B, and 49 feet of that stream bed for a total of 147 linear feet of impact, which means that you're going to be at least in the minor impact category. Um, even though the distance looks the same in terms of the 49 feet. So this is one of the points that I will emphasize that knowing the resources is extremely important. Stream crossings in the rules are also, the classification is related to the watershed size. So you have um, tier one, two, and three, with tier three being uh, 640 acres or larger, and that's one square mile. So that's definitely in the major impact category. And then there's a tier four, which is for tidal water courses, uh, which doesn't isn't limited um, to the watershed size category. So this is another criterion to apply to stream crossings. At the upper right, the diagram is the, uh, the map is from the uh, online mapping tool, USGS Stream Stats. And that was one of the tools that Steph Titro um, described. And um, you can actually uh, get a watershed created from a point and it can be exported to Google Earth or it can be put into ArcGIS. So 
I will go through some of the uh, various other categories that affect classifications, but I these will sometimes elevate the classification from a minimum or a minor to a major, as with a PRA, the priority resource area, or some things can be decreased in classification category instead of being a major minor, uh, could be minimum or it could be from a major to a minor. So, and a PTE is a project type exception. So with the resource type, um, I'll describe further the priority resource area, but that's a whole group of resources that can elevate a project to a, a higher classification. If you have a perennial stream, uh, a marsh, or a scrub shrub wetland that meets uh, additional criteria that are written in the rules, uh, these can elevate projects, uh, the classification, even though the linear impact, linear feet, or the square foot of impact uh, is, say, looks like a minimum impact. So the priority resource area, uh, which most of these are defined in the rules, I didn't highlight the fact that the ENV WT100 actually has a lot of the definitions, but there are some definitions in some of the other sections. Um, but if you start with the 100 section, you may find the definition there if you're trying to look something up. So the priority resource area, one of the first categories of criteria that kick something into being a priority resource area is if the applicant has done the required uh, data check report uh, using the data check tool um, at the Natural Heritage Bureau website to identify uh, occurrences of protected species or habitat, and this includes threatened and endangered species, um, state and federal. It includes um, bald eagles, and it also includes exemplary natural communities. So if you have documented occurrences, and usually they're, particularly for animals, they're in the vicinity. There are radii for which they uh, evaluate species because they move even if they're not found on the specific site. So that will kick something into a priority resource area. If you have a bog, and there's a special definition of bog, people tend to use bog uh, very loosely, but there is a special um, a definition in the rules. And then there are some other categories that you can use the wetland permit planning tool uh, to identify or an applicant can use it. Um, floodplain wetland contiguous to a tier three or higher water course, a designated prime wetland, or do we establish 100 foot buffer? Um, and then the um, coastal resources, sand dune, tidal wetland, those are all considered um, priority resource areas. And as I mentioned before, those tend to elevate projects. There are some exceptions and we'll talk about some of those. So there are project type exceptions. And so if um, a uh, species, a, a wildlife is found a certain distance and it's not near the specific location of the project, like for a docking structure or something, some of those things won't um, elevate the project and they're described in the project type exceptions area. Um, so it's in um, NVWT 407.04, uh, and there are the project specific categories in the section 500, and section 600 is for um, the coastal resources, and so there are specific criteria there for those projects and those resources. So project type exceptions will tend to drop a classification. Um, if it otherwise looks like it'll be a major, it, it might drop it. So I'm going to 
review uh, a little further the wetland applications that commissions review. Um, you can see these are, I have outlined that earlier diagram, I have outlined the application types um, in uh, darker circles. And these are the applications that commissions review. Um, so there are these other types of applications that are around, but the statutory permit by notification, uh, the commissions don't review. Um, they may use it themselves for forestry or for trails, um, but it's not in their review process. So um, I'm going to focus on these outline circles and, and we'll talk, we'll mention briefly some of the others. So in the rules, it talks about standard permits or projects. So this is uh, standard application, standard dredge and fill application. And if the expedited application is not signed off on by the Conservation Commission, that the commission doesn't waive its intervention, those become a standard permit as well. And so in ENV WT 311, it discusses the contents of the standard application. So for um, major minor impact projects, a functional assessment is required. Um, usually US ACE is US Army Corps of Engineers, um, the Highway Methodology Workbook and Supplement, or an alternatively uh, alternative scientifically supported method. So um, while the New Hampshire method was not designed for site-specific purposes, there are aspects of it that it is a functional assessment and um, can work um, in the functional assessment uh, requirement. Uh, applicants have to demonstrate avoidance and minimization um, DES has provided um, a checklist that an applicant can use, or they can, the applicant can provide a narrative. And actually, some parts of the checklist include a narrative, but um, there is the option if somebody wanted to write a, you know, a tome, they could, they could do that on avoidance and minimization. Um, in terms of mitigation, uh, there are requirements of having to uh, have a pre-application um, meeting and uh, information provided and the proposal components. We're not going to be talking about mitigation, but I wanted to make sure that um, in a standard permit, the mitigation would be required for any project that's a um, major impact project and or um, has the 10,000 square feet of impact. Now the core has, uh, Army Corps of Engineers has recently um, lowered that threshold to 5,000 square feet. And since the DES permit um, typically will act as a federal permit, if there's, um, it, it can act as a federal permit, um, there's some other information that DES has put out about the um, these uh, differences in, in thresholds that's on the website. Um, so one of the items that was added to the rules um, in this last major go round was uh, identifying that there is a required planning component. And among the required planning component is a classification of wetlands and streams. Um, the, what's referred to as the federal classification is often referred to as the coordinate system, Cowardin, depending upon how you pronounce it. Um, and that's basically the um, uh, system used for the natural uh, wetlands inventory, the um, palustrian forested, um, you know, seasonally uh, saturated and, and such. So those are the um, the bottom two, um, the, uh, the map on the left is the um, 
has the classification that's in an estuary area. So everything begins with an E. And on the right, it's a photograph that shows you the um, classification for the uh, PEM is palustrant emergent. Um, uh, so that's the type of classification that the um, applicant has to provide uh, for their um, the wetlands on the site and their project. I did want to mention, um, because it's helpful in knowing what the resources are, um, the boundary between freshwater wetlands and basically deep water habitats, when it's considered um, not a wetland because too deep is actually at 8.2 feet. Uh, so if you have a shallow, um, a very shallow pond, um, that would be considered all wetland versus um, being considered, um, you know, surface water and, and uh, not specifically wetland. Um, so the classification method is required on all plans submitted for the standard permit, and these are required to be done by a certified wetland scientist. If there are impacts to water courses and there are um, minor and major uh, <clears throat> impact crossings and there's a, a major bank stabilization projects, um, there needs to be the Rosgen um, classification, uh, which is helpful in identifying if there was uh, bank stabilization or in actually the stream crossings, does the stream um, will the crossing uh, be appropriate for the stream given the type of stream and the way materials move in it? So I had mentioned about the requirement for the wetland functional assessment. Um, there are components of the wetland functional assessment <coughs> that come from the rules. Um, some of them come from the um, RSA specifically, um, like ecological integrity, and some actually come from the core method, um, the current core method, which is a production e export for nutrients and uniqueness heritage. Um, so these are the categories <laughs> that need to be uh, considered in terms of the wetland functions. And um, DES has a uh, a sheet, a, a um, checklist for this. There, there's like a checklist and informational sheet for like everything. And um, you can take a deep dive there to um, check out some of these because you will find them um, helpful. So this is the functional assessment that needs to be done that will then support um, the uh, avoidance and minimization. So the applicant needs to use the results of the functional assessment to select the location of the project and the resource having the least impacts on the site and where there are unavoidable impacts. Um, was a project designed to impact those with the um, lowest functions um, on the site? And then, have the uh, has the applicant identified uh, minimization measures and construction practices that will be used when the project is being uh, constructed if it's uh, approved and so how does that minimize impacts to the resource whether it's something like surface water or whether it's wildlife is there a time of year restriction uh, because of when the wildlife will move or breed Uh, I mentioned there's uh, an avoidance and minimization checklist um, that the applicant has to complete and identify the various uh, techniques that have been used and approaches that were used to address this avoidance and minimization requirement. And while it's a checklist, as I mentioned, there's um, narrative text is required in various sections. The uh, document that DES has produced 
to assist applicants and also to really assist conservation commissions in reviewing applications is this uh, best management practice techniques for avoidance and minimization. And it provides a variety of, for a variety of projects, it provides information about how an applicant might avoid and minimize impacts to resources on the site for various types of projects. Um, if you um, look at stream crossings, um, this is an illustration of, okay, what do we mean by avoidance and what's minimization? So we have a stream in the top left box, uh, below it, um, oh, let's see, to the right, you can see that with two crossings of the stream, that project, and that's sort of like a, a road with a, um, uh, a circle there. Uh, it wasn't, that's not minimization if you're going to impact the stream in two places. Um, diagonally from that on the bottom left, um, so the applicant in this diagram has minimized the impacts by crossing the wetland once. And then in the bottom right, it's basically avoiding impacts to the stream altogether by not crossing it. Um, you know, sites are varied, projects are varied, top topography is varied, and there's a large gray area in terms of avoiding and minimizing for a lot of projects. Uh, definitely for subdivisions, it can be um, a challenge, um, no doubt about that. Um, so minimum uh, minor major impact projects uh, need to demonstrate their uh, nine aspects of um, minimization, avoidance of minimization, uh, the no practicable alternative with less adverse impact, uh, avoid and mi minimizing Im impacts to marshes, um, maintains hy hydrologic connections, uh, which is what you do when you avoid streams uh, where possible. And, and you can do it if you minimize impacts by having the right sized crossings. Uh, avoids and minimizes impacts to exemplary natural communities. So that's a, a PRA, a priority resource area. Uh, vernal pools, uh, documented fisheries. Uh, the other uh, remaining items uh, the, of the nine items. So uh, minimize impacts to commerce, navigation, and recreation, uh, minimizing impacts of floodplain wetlands. You have um, natural river forested wetland systems and scrub shrub complexes of high ecological integrity, um, wetlands adjacent to drinking water supply and, and groundwater aquifers, and stream channels and their ability to handle runoff. So a lot of um, ecological integrity and also a lot of hydrologic connections and maintaining the hydrology um, is part of the demonstration for minimum, uh, minor and major impact projects. So here's an example of, um, of a bank stabilization, two bank stabilization projects. Um, you can see that um, clearly there was some issue at the outer edge, which is typically the edge um, when a stream has abandoned at the outer edge is where you have the erosion. And uh, these show two different approaches and the diagram at the right, the photo at the right, uh, with a lot, a little more green growing there is really the least impacting alternative. It's not all just soil with things at the edges. There are uh, structures built in, um, but it doesn't have that heavy rock edge, which for wildlife is really um, not favorable at all. Um, definitely, that's the uh, that's the largest issue there, and it doesn't. Uh, provide any um, uptake of uh, nutrients or such that you would have if you left the, um, created a bank stabilization project where you have uh, vegetation growing. So there are um, project specific 
uh, requirements and worksheets. And so um, in these various areas, um, it will also indicate some of the project type exceptions. It'll say um, uh, what qualifies for the project, what information specific to that type of project needs to be provided. And um, they're um, helpful both to um, the applicant and, and to um, uh, conservation commissions in, in having a better handle on, on what's involved with the project. Um, the sections that are um, the project types that are noted in italics are actually um, apply also to projects in coastal areas. So um, even though they're in 500, the section 500, which is a general project specific section, they also apply to um, projects that typically are in section 600, which is the um, coastal resources area. So there are, um, as I mentioned, the coastal project specific criteria um, addresses things that are unique to um, coastal projects and coastal resources. Um, and once again, it provides the uh, criteria for um, what is in a minor or major category, um, if, if there are any project type exceptions, what information is required and, and such. There is also in um, the 300 section, um, conditions applicable to all activities. So it really across the board, um, it discusses the protection of water quality, um, protection of fisheries and breeding areas, the rare, threatened, or endangered species, prime wetlands and buffers, uh, protection against in invasive species, and uh, dredging and filling activities. So these are all things for any permit that people need to be held to. And if there is an issue there, that would be something that the Conservation Commission um, could identify. Um, the, I wanted to mention that there are um, different review times for projects, depending upon the amount of impact, um, the expedited, if it's, if the Conservation Commission has waived intervention, has a 30 day review time frame, and the standard dredge and fill or um, minor or major project is a 50 or 75 days, depending upon the uh, amount of impact. Um, applicants basically have one chance to address a, a request for more information. Sorry for not writing out that, that acronym. Um, if you wanna check the status and uh, get copies of some of the DES letters and permits, you can do that from the uh, wetland permits query. Um, when things are issued, they're available. You can see on the right, there's um, links where it says view uh, next to at the bottom where it has letter name, owner, document, sign date. If you click on the view, that's a link to the document and you can download the document there. Um, permit duration is typically five years. Uh, that's a standard duration. Um, for these um, general applications, well, the uh, uh, SPNs for forestry is actually two years, but um, there is a, a potential to get um, the time frame extended, and that's written in the rules as well. Uh, for any permit decisions, the appeals are to the um, Wetlands Council. Um, I was, I'll just go briefly through the permit by notification. There are 22 types. Um, I see uh, from our poll earlier on about um, half of the group um, has um, docks or lakefront activities and the permit by notifications, although there are 22 types, um, when I did a check on um, what projects were in the ones from um, that were uh, came in last year, it was um, 
far and wide the um, docking structures and shorefront projects. Um, uh, so they're uh, basically minimum impact projects, they're project specific criteria, they meet specific criteria. Um, now the Conservation Commission has to sign off on the permit by notification uh, to waive its right to intervention for uh, in advance of submittal before an applicant can really seek the permit by notification. And DES review time is is five days. I put a link at the bottom um, that you can get to the permit by notification. If you haven't looked at the forms, there's a description of the type of forms. There's links to all the different forms and information, particularly for permit by notification. So um, this is one set, um, <clears throat> kind of half the set of permit by notifications that includes waterfront and lake projects. So you can see the seasonal dock, dock anchoring pad, watercraft lift. Um, a lot of them are maintenance and repair. Um, so they're not all new things. And then the other permit by notifications um, that are not totally waterfront based are also some temporary crossings, repair, um, some forestry activity activities that are not eligible for an SPN, uh, agriculture, the um, agricultural activities are in this group, um, residential utilities. Once again, there are specific criteria, um, but there's this whole host, but the applicant cannot seek approval without the um, Conservation Commission signing off. Um, so these are the um, the Conservation Commission, um, where the Conservation Commission is not in the review process uh, for these statutory permit by notifications or permits by notification, however. And, um, and there are a couple of other things I've listed. There's the uh, small motor mineral dredging permit application, um, uh, which comes directly to DES. Um, there's an emergency authorization. So if somebody had a, um, and it's for public or private property, but it's for something that happened, uh, you know, recently, immediately, it has to be fixed to be able to, you know, access your house if a culvert blew out on your driveway and um, such. So there's um, criteria for emergency authorizations. But in general, these are the ones that, that conservation commissions will not be reviewing. Um, there are a variety of BMP, best management practice manuals. I mentioned the avoidance and minimization one, um, which applies to really the wetland permit types, expedited standard dredge and fill, especially. Um, the other best management practices manuals are required for use with the um, uh, statutory permit by notifications, the SPNs, or um, the registration, like the routine roadway maintenance registration. Um, there is a certified culvert maintainer program that gives um, um, authority to um, state and municipal employees to do uh, certain types of maintenance and uh, submit a quarterly report to DES. Um, so there's there are criteria there, and um, uh, that's another process that is not in the purview of the the review of the Conservation Commission. But you may um, find it helpful to know about that. So I did want to mention the um, abutter notifications. Um, this does describe uh, where it's not required in terms of the SPN or a PBN, unless it's specifically required, um, and what's considered a budding property, because the abutters from a um, state or DES wetlands perspective um, is likely different than the abutters from any town uh, ordinances. 
Uh, property line setbacks that are in the DES rules are basically um, 10 feet, except for a boat docking facility. And um, they, there may be some that are, um, have no property line setbacks. Um, DES can also require a larger setback if there's um, some issues there, they say, to abate the danger, hazard, or interference. Um, site walks are a great thing to conduct um, when possible. Um, you can field inspect to ensure resources are accurately represented on plans. Um, and then you can, in advance of that um, or in place of that, check some of the on online map tools to evaluate the resources in the vicinity of the project to see whether you can observe anything that um, may not be um, clearly represented on the plans. Um, so there are a variety of um, resources here. Um, these are pretty much related to the forms that DES has produced. Um, the, in some ways, <coughs> there are uh, some pages where you find um, all the forms listed. Um, but if you, uh, you may need to do a search term. So if you wanna look at everything that's for standard projects, you can put in the word standard and you'll get a list of all the wetlands things and a, a few other not wetland program things. Um, there are a lot of classification. There's a classification guidance document for the expedited minimum impact. Um, there's also, if you're not aware of, there's a wetland shoreland permit applications processing guide for city and town clerks, it's on the website that you may find helpful um, as well for um, discussing how permit applications or notifications or forms uh, need to be handled because it talks about those that don't need to come to the um, Conservation Commission for signature. Um, so I reviewed a variety of about the background, the past um, sessions that we've had, reviewed the project and impact classification, um, the various uh, permit applications, and particularly those that are reviewed by the Conservation Commission, and the uh, uh, permitting processes and, and requirements and where you can find those requirements, because I can't describe all of them in, in uh, a short talk. And then uh, we talked about a little bit about the resources. So um, I will uh, leave it open to questions. I see there are 24 things in the chat and um, hopefully we can, uh, between me and, and Mary Ann uh, Tilton, we can um, get those addressed. And I see Mary Ann has answered yeah. some. We do have a couple. I, I've, I've been kind of answering some. Let's see. So um, how about this one from Linda? What happens when an application is submitted to the New Hampshire DES without the Conservation Commission sign off in the middle of winter when the affected wet wetlands are covered with snow and ice? Uh, it's a little bit of a two part question, but how can the CC analyze impacts when the wetlands are frozen? Yeah. <laughs> um, that's where the, um, well, a couple of things. You can do a walk in the snow uh, because you may notice things that you still would not ever notice if you weren't there. Um, you know, um, <laughs> we once did a walk in the snow in a project and there was like sensitive fern, the um, sporophylls that, that stay all winter long. Um, Granted, if you have too deep a snow, you wouldn't see them. But you know, they were kind of coming up through, and we said, you know, well, we, you know, we need to see this later in the year. It might have been a town project, but the fact is, you could um, file a comment letter to DES and and mention what you observed that maybe raise your concerns. Uh, what trees are present? I mean, I know that things like red maple grow from wetlands to uplands, but it might be helpful. Do you, um, can you see kind of a landscape that you suspect uh, may have runoff 
uh, going in a certain direction. Um, then the other thing is using the online mapping tools um, and really uh, going through all of those. Look at the um, aerial imagery with the color infrared, um, which you may not be familiar with. It's often it says CIR in capital letters because um, that will often highlight certain things. So someone maybe called something a wetland and you're thinking, nah, you know, I think that might be a stream, you know, look on it with a color infrared and you might see a, a much more defined uh, line there that might kind of support that, you know, we think this is probably a a stream and not a wetland. So um, that's where a lot of those mapping tools come in handy, but it, it's, a, it's a challenging issue, I, I agree. Yeah, I do agree that wetland, wetlands mapper tools can help. And, and again, I think just commenting to New Hampshire DES that because of the time of year, you feel like you don't have enough information. Mm -hmm. um, another question is who enforces whether the permit or any recommendations or contingencies are carried out? Well, I think um, it's something that if the Conservation Commission is noticing and you're not trespassing, um, but you're noticing that there are some things that you believe are not being addressed as written in the permit. Um, contact DES uh, if you can send a photo or other description that's specific enough to like a condition in the permit that you think is an issue. Is there um, sedimentation down gradient because of poor erosion controls? Um, you know, poor erosion controls overall, um, it would be DES that would be enforcing the permit. Is, is that a time when you'd fill out a complaint form or would you just try to go to DES? Yeah, I, I fill out a complaint form. I think DES yeah. prefers to have the complaint forms completed. It ensures that they get the information that they need. Okay. And, um, and we, we can include that um, on our follow-up links as well. Mm -hmm. um, so if a person crosses a perennial stream and there's no permit, how should the CC best proceed? And if they're crossing with heavy equipment? I, and I guess, again, uh, it depends on what type of, if it's a forestry stream crossing, technically, that would fall under statutory permit by notification. Is that right? Well, there are the there are a couple of things. Um, there, there's some. I guess if they're really driving through a stream that has running water, um, that is an issue. Um, and in in um, and maybe Marianne can address in, in when, when uh, a developer is trying to identify, do test pits and identify, um, you know, septic locations and stuff, um, they're allowed to travel through a wetland temporarily, but there are probably degrees of, you know, like the damage, but the problem is if you're going through a stream that has running water, you could flowing water, you could, you know, be causing um, um, erosion sedimentation downstream. So, um, you know. Yeah, I, I guess that I, does I, I would depend. Kind of, I, yeah. You know, I would. Um, if, if you do, I, I think that would be another one where you might want to send in a complaint form if you feel like it's really, you know, a, a disastrous impact. Um, but again, it's it's a lot. It's hard because a lot of these are very case by case. Yeah, I mean, I, the other thing would be: is it possible, depending upon the landowner, is it possible to contact the landowner and say, you know, you're going through the stream, it, it's causing issues. What type of project are you doing? Because if you're doing a forestry, uh, a if they're doing things, if they're doing forestry and going through a stream and are not following BMPs, um, 
while you can contact DES in the past, I, I would find that contacting the forest rangers at yep. um, um, DNCR is helpful because they tend to be in the field more. Um, um, but if you don't know if it's forestry or something else, then um, if you can contact the landowner, that's the best way to do it. I, can you talk to the operator? I, I don't know whether that's, you know. Um, and, and sometimes the landowners don't realize that they needed a permit for that work. And, and you know, they if you're able to reach out to them and provide them with some information, they can often be, um, you know, helpful to work with. So so that that's definitely an option as well. And if you feel like it's a really egregious issue, you could file that complaint form. Okay, so there's some, we need some clarification on what permits Conservation Commission signed. So here it says, you know, is the only, is on, the expedited application the only one provided for Conservation Commissions to sign? There's also the permit by notification, which they can sign. But that doesn't mean that doesn't include a standard permit, which right. A any of the, okay, I did that diagram that had, and I could probably bring that, that back up. The up, diagram back, back that had circles. the yep. dark circles. So those are the ones that come before the conservation commission, um, or or that the conservation commission um, has the authority to review. So the permit by notification. They can't submit it without the Conservation Commission signature. The expedited, um, if they want to use the 30-day review process um, and the Conservation Commission is comfortable with the project, the Conservation Commission can sign off, which means they're waiving intervention. So you're not going to be providing any further comment on it because you've decided it's, it's A-OK. -okay. The standard dredge and fill, you have to, there, you have the ability to review it. There's a time frame in which you have to tell DES, we want to intervene, and then a certain number of days before you have to provide that comment. If you um, haven't seen, I did a presentation in November at the NHACC annual meeting and conference. And it's posted on the website, and that goes into detail on um, the time frames for reviewing expedited applications and suggestions for how to do that so that um, if it's out of sync with the time frame of your meeting, what you can do, um, particularly for the standard dredge and fill applications. Yeah, that's a good, we can provide those links as well in the follow-up email. So um, another really good question is, um, what should we be looking for when, when an application is presented? What are the typical reasons for CC not to sign? Well, um, what, uh, A, if you, haven't seen the site and and you know there's some things on the horizon that will affect this but really it's it's helpful to be able to see the site see what the drainage is is there anything that's going to be a problem um is there um uh, are the you know starting with existing conditions where like half the work was done already um i, I mean there are a whole bunch of things um Uh, you know, um, how familiar are you with the resource? Is it really just a um, a small impact? Um, do you know the area in general? Um, I and mean, I think are... well, our next program on um, wetlands assessment might touch a little bit more on you know what to look for in the field. So right, um, right. Yes, yeah, that, that should help, although a full-blown wetland assessment will only be required by an applicant for minor and major impact projects. But yes, I think the functional assessment, a, a lot of it's really, um, what are the current conditions? 
because the other thing is um, it's good to know for, for later on when they do the work and they may not do the work as proposed. But, um, you know, I would say the perennial stream crossing, um, if there's um, in terms of what you want to look at, um, have they characterized the stream properly? Um, are the banks eroding now? How big of a crossing um, are they proposing? Um, do they have the um, sizing done properly? Did they look at the watershed size? Obviously, when you go in this field, you don't see the watershed size. But really, um, some of the things that you can um, check into and confirm, or did they provide a copy of the stream stats to show the watershed size that it was, you know, small enough to qualify for whatever, but a stream crossing, other than subject to a project type exception, um, will be a minor major impact project. So, um, yeah, and, and simply, you know, just kind of doing a little research to make sure that they applied for the proper permit, and it's not, you know, possibly a bigger impact than what they're they're uh, proposing. Right. So, all right, well, we have another good question about a request for more information. How long does an applicant have to respond to a request for more information? And at what point does that request expire and the applicant have to reapply? Um, I believe, I, and Marion can correct me, I, I think it's 60 days they have to respond. Um, <laughs> And they can request a time extension before that 60 days goes by if there's some reason that they need a time extension. Um, I, I don't, um, it, it's actually spelled out in the rules. Um, but I think that, um, yeah, so that that's basically how that works. That, that right. Works. Yeah. So it's the 60 days and, and unless they need an extension on that 60 days. And okay. that's it. Um, I think the example that I put up to show the wetland permits query, I think they had, um, they actually did requested a time extension. And that was one of the letters listed in the um, documents that you can see in the wetland permits query. Okay, so another question for Claire. So I'm just going to jump in oh, on yeah, that. Go ahead, Marianne. Um, just so you know, we do frequently get time extension requests, and uh, we will be updating the rules to reflect what the statute says. Um, the department um, it doesn't have any discretion really to deny an extension, so they are often extended. So we will have a lot, a lot of projects where by mutual agreement, there might not be sufficient information. And so we do have a number of projects that are in the extension mode for that reason. I'm happy to comment on any of the other questions. One of the questions was about the um, stream that had been crossed. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I would just say is if it looks like it's something that would have been permittable, um, they can file an after the fact application. Um, but if, as Sandy said, if there's ongoing erosion, it's something that we could have a greater environmental harm and something we might not allow if they're accessing an area that, for example, doesn't have developable uplands, um, then those are ones that would, should go right to the complaint route. Okay, helpful. Um, Thank you. And maybe again, some clarification on um, the review of permit by notification. Does the Conservation Commission have the right to review docs? and other permit by notifications. Um, and well, I guess you could yeah, clarify well, that permit by notification process. Not, well, and then, again, it's different from statutory permit by notification. You need yeah, to make- Well, that's SPN, right, right? Statutory permit by note, yeah. So things that are an SPN do not go, yeah, you put it there, Barbara. So SPNs do not, in, they go directly to DES, but PBNs, have conservation commission signature. Yeah, um, it's not so, really and, review, is it? It's more of a FYI kind of thing is how I interpret it. But I guess if you had questions, you could still raise those, right? For a permit right. And 
And um, there's a question about uh, utility maintenance. And yeah. we do have, um, or, you know, DES does have BMPs for utility maintenance. And, and I believe I should, I, I think I have access to that. So I can include yeah, that. Yeah, there, there is a BMP for utilities. It does. Um, I put a link in the chat for all the BMPs. Oh, nice. I'll make sure that gets in the follow-up email as well. So you'll look in there and the utility one is near the bottom of that link, but all the uh, BMPs are linked on that page. It, 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 I will say based upon my experience, it doesn't, it doesn't have a whole lot about mowing. There's less about mowing than about other aspects of maintenance. So in terms of uh, utility maintenance, um, SPNs, which uh, is a large, um, has increased significantly actually over the last year, the amount of right away utility work. And um, there, if there is conversion that would be required by the Army Corps of Engineer conversion, meaning you're converting a wetland, a forested wetland to a, a, a different type of wetland where you're eliminating forest cover, the Army Corps will require mitigation for that. And if that's the case, it would not qualify for an SPN. Anytime there's mitigation required, that would that would put it onto the standard pathway. So it's important to understand the scope of those SPNs. There's a very quick turnaround time for DES on that. Yeah, I think I think um, in in most of the utility line maintenance that we see. It's really, um, they're doing the mowing, but I guess the the thing is that it's pretty much everything within a certain, you know, it, we're, they're not converting forests, but there are, um, everything's being mowed to the same height, whether or not it would grow tall enough. So, um, but that's an issue for another day. Okay, um, so. Oh, a question about permission for site walks. Yes, that is a good one. <laughs> I will say at the moment, the uh, application forms allow commissions to do site walks as a condition of submitting the permit application. However, uh, early notice, <laughs> from DES is that apparently uh, is expected to change uh, because I understand, I guess it's not in the statute. So um, you'll be seeing more on that uh, in the future. Yeah, I think the bottom line is you, you, you do need to get landowner permission um, it doesn't have to be in writing, but you have to have at least documented uh, landowner permission to be able to access their property. Right. So, but, so, but right now, but right now, if they submit an application, it has that yeah. statement about allowing access to the Conservation Commission. Right. So hopefully we will be able to work out something where the permit itself will have a checkbox or something that can then, you know, give you uh, permission. Mm. So let's see, um, any background information to share on successes, um, et cetera, for the issuance of administrative inspection warrants for major dredge and fill. So that's a follow-up kind of to the, um, mm. you know, the landowner permission piece, right? So if, if you can't get landowner permission, you can get this administrative inspection warrant. Marianne, do you want to, how do you deal with the administrative inspection warrants? Well, so I've never seen that. The only time I know that we've had a warrant was on a criminal um, investigation. So okay. we've been here 32 years. So I've never seen that. All right. DES has its own authority to right. go on site of uh, You know, I, I think it would be you'd have to, um, aside from the warrant thing, you know, is <clears throat> documenting if where you see there might be some issues and 
providing that information to DES. Yeah. Unless yeah. you have local regulations that uh, apply um, that they are subject to as well. Yeah, that's a good good point as well, because you can have local regulations that have a, a little bit more um, access for commissions. Um, all right, so what is the DES definition of expedited? Um, it's, uh, I believe it's still 30 days from receipt if, DE, if the Conservation Commission has signed off on the, you know, to waive its intervention. So if it comes into DES with the Conservation Commission signature waiving intervention, it would be 30 days from receipt, I believe. Okay, so we've got some good information from Marianne, which I'll make sure we have in the follow-up email. Um, and then from Kristen, we have, we tend to not receive the response from the application to a uh, request for more information, and we do not see their response in the wetland permit query. Is there a way to be able to see these uh, responses? Yeah, this is, this is a major issue from my perspective <laughs> um, because um, we do not, I know they are told that they're supposed to provide it to the Conservation Commission and they often do not. Um, so- um, Can you request it from DES? Well, you can, but the issue is that it should be the applicant I mean, really, we should be contacting the applicant and saying, please oh. send us a copy of your okay. response. Okay, I see. So that does make sense. Go, go to the applicant whenever possible. Um, and then the question, why do this um, commission sign a permit by notification if it's informational? I mean, I think it's it's important for commissions to know, you know, this was one of those, and Marianne, you might have to help me, um, but I believe this was one of the changes that happened at the last rules change. And our response was commissions need to at least know about these things happening in their communities. And so the resolution to that was, well, all right, we'll, we'll make sure that the permits are signed so that it's um, apparent that there is some sort of wetland activity going on in their community, because if you don't get it a, a permit by notification, you might be just driving down the road and wonder what the heck is going on over there. And it's, you know, often beneficial to at least know ahead of time that that, you know, parcel is going to be impact, those wetlands on that parcel will be impacted and to give you a heads up. Um, right. Most of those ones, I can't remember, there's like eight, I believe, that the CONCOM, um, do not sign it doesn't slow the project down the the department has the authority to just process it without a concom signature and most of them are maintenance projects like shoreline structure maintenance i think there might be um, some small shoreline projects as well um, so the idea is that the minimum impact process was created in the statute to allow streamlining so that's why um, some of those projects were added um, to streamline it for those small projects. But if you see something going on, like say they had an existing dock and it turned out they really didn't, that's where the CONCOM can file a complaint. Um, and we have had that happen. Yeah, yeah. So um, so it is important to just be you know informed of what's happening in your community. So here's a good question about the permit processing guide for city and town clerks, which I think is helpful and we have kind of a version of it as well that involves commissions. Um, and I think the 91621 is the most recent, but Marianne, I'll, I'll have you confirm that. Um, and second, it says that projects that have a T symbol in section two of the app, it's, it's exempt from obtaining a CC signature in order to qualify for expedited. For the PBN review. Yeah, I, um, I'd have to look at the form I didn't. Yeah, and again, I think that kind of goes back to what Marianne said, that the PBMs are um, more of an informative, um, there's not really like a review process there, it's, it's FYI. 
Um, let's see, do you still need permission if the property is not posted? I think Marianne answered that. Oh, oh, she did. Great. Sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, if wetland application is from a prospective landowner contingent upon being able to build on the property, does the commission have to get permission from the current landowner? Well, the, um, Yeah, that's a good point. So I believe the only thing is there is a part on the um, application where it where we do have this a lot of time, especially with the all the real estate going on in New Hampshire, where we will get an authorized letter, uh, which allows um, right. the prospective buyer or whatever to serve as the agent. Act on his behalf. And but we need something legally in writing showing that whoever is seeking um approval for the project that uh, they have landowner permission sometimes it can be in the form of a right-of-way easement um, but when you have the whole property that's subject to uh, future sale uh, we will have we will need to have that authority as part of our review yeah it's, it's kind of acting you're the new the prospective person is acting on behalf of the landowner yeah, there's a section under RSA 42A11 that talks about uh, proof of ownership, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, so you can look at that. That's probably the best guide on that. So the question about access is still a little confusing and that you do need permission. Um, I mean, I guess um, what, you know, do you have any recommendations if, if the, um, landowner doesn't give you permission. I guess that's when the online mapping tools can be helpful or. Yeah, and I think the photographs, I put in a few clips from the rules on photos. Okay. Um, and it does, I do think the ConComs, um, if they aren't gonna get access to the site need to be more uh, prepared and looking at the information that's provided. So say they give us winter photos where you can't tell what the resource is, you can't understand the impact. That would be a great question for the Conservation Commission to raise to DES. And DES um, has to respond to those issues in writing or through findings, even if we don't agree. So those are things um, that would help you assess things, um, looking at the plans, looking at the aerial photos, the desktop tools. And it's kind of like a puzzle. You have the plan, the photos. Um, the ground photos, the aerial photos, so all that information together, if there's historic impacts or town information, all of that's going to help um, DES and hopefully the applicant in figuring out uh, what the next steps are. All right, well, we're down to our last question here, um, two parts, but is there a way for commissions to get copies, as an FYI, of shoreland applications? Again, it's just in the spirit of knowing what's going on in the community. Mm -hmm is uh what's is that i don't think it's required it's a different process it was set up later than the, the wetlands process but i do think that all of the permits you can look at the wetland shoreland inquiry through one it's stop, the one stop right one stop and we do have through the wetland planning tool i think it does post the wetland in the shoreland permitted points online and so that's a good way um, so you have, and there's, we've been updating the wetland permit planning tool, that uh, online tool. If you haven't had a chance, check it out because the more you use it, the better you get at it. And we keep trying to refine the base map layers that includes wetland base maps, which, you know, it's core screening, but it's better than nothing. You do have LIDAR now. You have, um, you know, the parcel mosaic, which is the tax map used by 911. And then you'll have a lot of um, aerials and basic information. If you haven't checked out Steph Tetralt's talk, I listened to the whole thing and I've been here for a year and I learned several things. Okay. And it's, um, she goes to everything from these, the uh, arm mapper on how she looks at stream crossings down the line to um, desktop tools that are really helpful. So I would encourage you to check that out. Yeah. The, and that's on our YouTube. Uh, yeah. station and, and, and the um, one thing that I would suggest that I actually haven't done recently, uh, although I haven't done it specifically, is go to the wetland permits query periodically and say, okay, in the past quarter, since January 1st or whatever, what 
permits have come through or forms have come through for my town. And you can just do a search based upon your town for whatever period of time. And you can go, oh, look, they got a, you know, a forestry notification for something here. And they did. So it, it, it's a great way to see what's what comes in. And then um, any of the documents that were printed that go out are um, downloadable from the query. Yeah. And that's on one stop, right? Right. Yep. OK, wonderful. Um, a, yeah, one one what, stop wetlands permit query. One you go stop to the if you permit. go to the DES one, you don't you don't get there. OK, well, we might have to maybe you could send me that link um, just to make sure I'm getting people to the right. OK, stop. Um, uh, all right. Well, we have one more question about the rules change and um, New Hampshire um, NHACC. We will be um, keeping our members posted about the potential rule change coming up. Um, and I believe that's coming out in May with a comment period in June. Does that sound up? Oh, Marianne's ahead of me. She said they will be posted on the website. Um, and then they, there will be time for public comment as well. So um, we will definitely keep you posted, but that's going to be, uh, you know, coming out in May and June. Yeah, and so the process is the conservation commissioners do have a representative, I believe it's going to be Sandy Crystal, yeah. <laughs> on the Wetlands Council. And before the department can file the initial proposal, it does have to go to the council. And so she'll have an early uh, review um, before the general public. And then, uh, then it does get posted onto our website as well. And there is a public hearing as indicated by Barbara Richter where um, folks will be able to comment. Obviously it's great if you can, I know Barbara is very good at updating her newsletter and letting folks know what's going on. And um, so she, I would imagine she would be submitting public comments on it. Yeah, I will definitely, I'll probably send out a special announcement in our email. email um, for that. So, um, you know, if you're not getting our e-news, let me know. Um, well, this has been very helpful. And again, I recognize this is a lot of information, um, but this is really meant to be an overview of all of the permits. Uh, keep in mind that when you are, um, you know, going through the permit review process, you, you'll just be doing, you know, one permit at a time here. So you won't have to know everything, but you'll have to know where to find everything. So that's kind of what we're, we're focused on here today is like, these are all the different rules, depending on the impact, the size, the, all of that, you know, different rules apply. So, um, so you really do have to kind of know how to sort through all this information. Um, but when you're doing the application review, don't feel like you need to know every single piece of information that Sandy Crystal has in her head because <laughs> I, it's, it's unfortunately, not head, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So even Sandy, you probably have to go through and double check things and know, okay, I'm going to check this rule language for this, or, you know, I'm going to go to one stop and, for this. And then, and then I find things on the DES website, on the wetlands website, there's, oh, look at that form. I, I never saw that document or Right. Or what have you. Um, so, you know, try and take the time to really poke around when you have some flexible flexibility to, um, you know, look at some of the forms or look at some of the documents or. Um, yeah, you know. I think looking at the forms is very helpful. I found that really helpful um, to just help you kind of digest the information that's required for each form and then kind of what would be expected of you. Marianne, you know, I think sent us, we'll be able to include that link as well, but on the DES website, you can find the actual forms. And it, when you're not in the middle of a, you know, a, a big permit review, just maybe familiarize yourself with, with the different forms and the different, you know, terms, PBN, expedited, and standards so that you can, you know, again, feel more comfortable with all these acronyms being thrown at you um, and what is required for each of those different permits. And then when you get your permit, it won't be kind of this big shocker or, you know, what are we supposed to do with this? So anyway, um, you know, we also on the NHACC website, we have a lot of inform information on wetland permit review, as well as those 
you know, again, it's a breakdown um, similar to what the town clerks are required to do. Um, you know, we'll we'll be providing some more information in the links to this follow up program. And it looks like Marianne has one more one more comment. One All more right. Comment. Sorry about that. No so I, I did present at the annual meeting and uh, I did make this little pitch and I'll say it again. Um, and so uh, since I've been here many years, I've seen some concoms come and go. And one reason I was really excited about this training is I really want conservation commissions to think about their role in their community. Um, I do think of the three R's. So if you're reasonable, respected, and resilient. So I, I want folks to realize that you need to understand you know, that property owners do have a right to develop their property. Um, and that when you do make comments, make sure it's within the, the limits of your understanding. Um, some, you know, some of these things are, you know, I noticed in the chat, you have to be a wetland scientist. Well, sometimes you do, you know, if there's a big complex technical issue and you don't feel comfortable uh, commenting on that, then I wouldn't comment on that. So I'm trying to see that, you know, conservation commissions, they're, they're usually not paid, right? They're all volunteer. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some red flag issues that Sandy has raised, you know, based on the size and scale of the project. Um, you know, looking at some dramatic things. For example, we had an application the other day where there was no wetland delineation, no wetland functional assessment. They said there was no mitigation. It was over 10,000 square feet. Um, they didn't delineate the wetlands. They didn't have any wetlands stamped. And so all of the things that should have been done were not done, about 10 big items. And so that should have never, you know, the CONCOM should have been red flag, you know, that they haven't even done the basics. And so I think that if you start to become familiar with it, you can become more confident in what you're, you know, Sandy is the chair of her commission, has worked at DES and is a professional wetland scientist. Not everyone has all those skills and knowledge, but that doesn't mean you can't figure out some of the basics. Do you have a wetland plan? Should they have done that? You know, um, so I think that those are some key things. I just put a shout out. We do have the wetland functional assessment training coming here in Concord. We're doing it uh, on site after uh, we do the one with Rick in April. And I will be bringing, I have some extra hard copy avoidance and minimization BMPs to the first folks that come and we'll be handing those out. So we have a couple boxes of those. And so it's hoping to give out extras for folks and communities that don't have them. But anyway, I just appreciate all your dedication. I know it's a hard job and it can be um, challenging as volunteer work, but it's very important. And so I think it's important to try to build that confidence and respect from your community. Thank you. I have a question. Thanks so much. Yes, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, if the Conservation Commission has drones, can they fly over property without necessarily getting the property owner's commission or permission? I don't know the answer to that. Mm -hmm. I think the town attorney should answer that. I know there are drone licensing requirements. I don't know the answer. That's a good question. I'll Thanks. do a little digging and see if I can find anything. Because yeah, maybe I the municipal association knows. Yeah, 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 the municipal association might be a good one. Um, I'll, I'll see what I can find, because I also don't want to answer that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, wonderful. We're, we're getting up to the, the 130 piece. And I want to, again, thank uh, Mary Ann and Sandy for all the time and effort they've put into this, um, this training series. Um, the, the last three are coming up for uh, May and June. And again, we will be having one more Zoom series um, that will take us through the prep class for the wetlands assessment field training. And I'll have all those dates and registration on the follow-up email as well. So again, thank you all for the work you do. Um, yeah. Thank you for taking the time to, to learn more about wetlands and how to better protect them in your community. Um, and again, NHACC, we're here to help, New Hampshire DES. So, um, I know it's a lot of information, and if you do need more information or, or a little bit more specifics, please feel free to reach out. Yeah, so, put uh, the things in the evaluation, you know, yes. and comments in the evaluation on other areas to be covered. And right. if you're really feeling lost, start looking at the earlier presentations again. 
Yes, the, the other per presentations are on our uh, website through our YouTube channel. So again, have everybody have a great afternoon and uh, we'll see you in April. Thanks. Great, thank you.